second. I'm ready. Thank you. I am ready to thank you all for coming this evening. Um, it's so great to see you all. And this is just always a great way to end the semester and end the, the school year. So um, my name is Valerie Nye. I'm the library director. And um, I'm always honored that uh, Emily asked me to join her in co-hosting this program. So, um, and I love reading. So I'm really looking forward to your work, hearing it and seeing it. I wanted to let you know that we are recording this evening's meeting um, and reading, uh, and we will be posting it on the SFCC YouTube page. And I just want to point out, Emily, since you're a co-host, the recording is going to save to your computer and we'll figure out how to um, get that set up soon, tomorrow, first thing. Um, it will be posted to the SFCC YouTube page within about a week at the latest. Um, tonight, we want to focus on the person who is reading. So we ask that if you are not reading, that you have your mic turned off. And we ask that during the applause portion of the, um, after somebody has read, that you turn your camera on and do some kind of motion to let People know you're applauding for them, um, but we're trying to keep mic sound uh, to a minimum tonight. And then um, I think everybody who's planning to share their screen has mentioned that to Emily, um, but we'll work with everybody who would like to share their screen. Just let us know if that's something you'd like to do, and we'll give you permission to do that. And with that, I'll turn things over to Emily Stern. Thank you so much, Val. And thank you so, so much for everything that you do to support this awards process and this event. Um, so welcome everybody. I am honored to be here for another year of the Katie Besser Student Art and Writing Awards. It's such a pleasure. And we have fantastic work um, that fantastic people have created and shared. Um, and so I wanted to begin by sharing my screen again. And please let me know, is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes, wonderful. Yes, we can see. Thank you. All right. So I wanted to begin um, by thanking SFCC's foundation uh, for supporting our event every year and for uh, helping to maintain a scholarship, uh, the Richard Bradford Memorial Scholarship, which we will be awarding this evening. I'm thrilled to say, and look forward to that a little bit later. Um, and I wanted to thank the Media Arts Department, and I wanted to thank Creative Writing uh, and the English Department, and especially I wanted to thank Kate McCahill who's the chair of the English department. And of course, um, my deans, Shalimar Krebs and Jim Wysong, Dr. Wysong and Dr. Krebs. So thank you to all of them. And a special thank you to our creative writing teachers and then to all of you and to the family and friends who are here to support your folks in their fabulousness. So thank you all for being here. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, that we are on land that I don't personally know how to define and certainly wouldn't be qualified, but it means something to me to acknowledge that this land has been taken wow. care of and, and maintained by people and cultures that have existed in the past and exist now. And I am in relationship to them and I'm so grateful to be here. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge the land we're on and its history and all that it gives me um, every day. So thank you. Um, and that is how I wanted to open. And so now I would like to invite our first reader um, and some folks I wanted to mention some folks may not be here this evening to read 
but I'm going to acknowledge them anyway. And uh, so that that's part of what's going on here. So let's begin, please. Is Jonah with us this evening to read? Jonah, are you here? Yes, I am. I'm so glad to see you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, would you like to share your screen? Um, that's okay. I was going to read off my screen. So mine just might go dark for a minute while I'm reading to all of you. But um, yeah, I, I can get going whenever. Welcome, Jonah. Thank you very much, Emily. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to see everybody here. And I wanted to say thank you all for coming too. Um, I guess I didn't send Emily a bio, so I have to say a little short one. I guess, yeah, my, my name is Jonah Boudreaux, and I've been studying with the creative writing department here at SFCC for about a year and a half now, and um, have been writing for about 10 years with the uh, hopes of eventually releasing some books. And grew up here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, born and raised and still just loving getting to write about this land and this place and express it. Um, equally grateful for it too, Emily. But uh, yeah, I guess without further ado, I can get started on my piece. All right, do I still have all of you? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. I'm just pulling up the piece now. So this is one I wrote called Brave Enough. Um, here it goes. The Tibetans had a prayer that they chanted for hours, one I had come to live by. It translates in English to sound is God. This resonates with me as many sounds do. Music has without question been the love of my life. My father was a drummer and my mother played the guitar. It's how they met in fact, playing together. My mom tagged along with her friend Andres to play music jam all night and drink merrily for even longer at some new guy Jesse's house. They went over to join each other and the other flannel and denim clad kids with long bleached hair and nose piercings and played Smashing Pumpkins covers until they just couldn't stop noticing each other more than their hands playing music. Too distracted to keep playing in time with the rest of the band, I imagine they stepped outside to talk on the dark back porch and the rest is history. So you could say that music is in my blood. I first sat upright at a drum set and incoherently banged away when I was two years old. And I've been learning to slightly less incoherently bang on them incrementally since then. Along the way, I've picked up a lot of love for various string and key instruments though nothing has ever compared to my attachment to my drum set and my bass guitar. So you could also say I have listened to and adored far more music than you and I would want me to try and fit on these pages. I would bore you. But with Goliath's strength, music impacts me, it kicks me in my chest and brings me to my knees quite regularly. I can name you 20 bands that I have fallen in love with and been dragged all over my inner emotional terrain by and say in detail what makes them unique and irrefutably important to the history of music. But I am going to start by just picking one. There is an indie folk group that has been around for a while called Of Monsters and Men. They write the kind of songs that make you want to do a victory dance sob deeply, and run fast in the wind all at once. My mother showed them to me. When I was young, it was some of the first music that we sang together and that I learned on the guitar. There was one song we loved to play, the whole family, sing on every road trip that is called King and Lionheart. 
It is a song about a kingdom falling, being stormed by wild monsters, and the queen trying to escape with her son before it all crashes down around them. In the end, they get separated, and the son has to carry his mother's last words with him. You will be the king with a lion heart. If you've ever watched the music video, I can promise you a tear or two. It might be one of those saddest pieces. It might feature the least banjo, but it gives us all goosebumps. I've listened to that song thousands of times, but I can remember hearing it the loudest twice. Once, the first, being 12 years old, driving with my dad alone in his truck at sunset a few months after he was put out of commission from work thanks to a spinal injury. His center was cracked and crooked and he could feel it. It had been a hard couple of months for him, feeling like there was nothing he could do to support his family. And it was wearing on him. I saw it in the worry lines on his brow, deepening by the day. That song came on while we were driving through the mountainous pines, tinted auburn by the light. He turned it up loud and I watched as they sung of bravery and downfall. I watched as the hairs on his arms and neck rose straight up. For the whole song, he was silent, eyes wide. It was like I could see all his electrified ends pulse with every beat of the drum. When it was over, he shed one tear, a rare thing, and admitted to me that every bit of that song made him want to roar like a lion and run away like a forgotten king. The other time, my heart felt that electricity in the air. I was 15. I had just returned from two weeks at a mental institution in the middle of the desert after a dangerously near successful suicide attempt my fifth. I felt heavier in my whole body, like the lithium supply they had stuck me on was filling my veins. Heavy metal blood dragging me to the floor. I was raw and weak. I could barely speak after weeks of screaming and protest to their attempts at fixing me. I had been silent the whole way home despite my parents kindly and compassionately trying to welcome me back and support me. When we got back, I fell on my knees to the ground in the yard next to my dog, who I had missed more than anyone. I fell all the way down next to him, and he laid with me as I felt the grass blades scrape my cheeks and what had felt like a lifetime. The sun began to set before long. My parents left me to be with him for a while before they came out to lay their hands on both of us reassuringly. My mother brought out her guitar that she had kept since the night she met my father. The lamination on the wood body beginning to wear after nearly 20 years of being treasured. And the neck was just a little scratched by now. She sat by my head and began to strum the beginning of that song like a lullaby. There's one thing you should know. My mother has the most beautiful singing voice in the whole world. She sounds like a choir angel and can hold a note so long you don't stop falling into it when it's over. She likes to play every song in her own way and it always turns out more beautiful and moving than the original. When she sang to me this time, I wept from the bottom of my heart with gratitude to be alive, to be washed with her gentle voice. I cried into my Labrador's golden coat until it was dark brown with tears and dug my fingernails into the roots of the grass. So glad to be home. So glad that I got to hear this song sung by my beautiful mother. So glad to be able to taste dirt mixed with my tears I feel so moved by the sound of a guitar to fall apart. That song brought me home, all the way from the deepest depths of my darkest caverns, back out into the light of that sunset. 
I had never been more glad to be home. What that song means to me, what it had meant to my whole family, is hope. It is a cry for hope, cries. Yes, I am brave enough to stand up among everything crumbling around me. Yes, I can roar with pride to my last breath. My family has been through a lot. We've had it anything but easy in my lifetime. But somehow we have held this crumbling, leaking ship together. While it has been hard to patch every seam, I don't think I would have wanted any less wild of a ride. At least on this boat, we have great music playing as we go down. Thank you all. Incredible. Thank you so much, Jonah. That made me cry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily and everyone. I appreciate you all listening. Pleasure and a gift. All right. Our next reader, our next reader, let me share my screen. <clears throat> our next reader is Marcelina Gallegos. And Marcelina won several, uh, uh, her several pieces won. <laughs> um, and so Fruit of the Poisonous Tree was a winner in poetry. In fiction, witches won. Uh, little Girl, Little Girl After Mother Goose was a poetry honorable mention. La, San La Sangre Lama, Yama, it's always when you're on right here. Here I am. Okay. And then the earth rang twice, or I'm sorry, uh, that was the creative nonfiction runner up. And the earth rang twice is the creative nonfiction honorable mention. And so Marcelina, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. My audio is a little, hopefully that's better. It's sounding, it does sound better. Um, yeah, and would you like to share your screen or may I? Yeah, I can share my screen. Okay, wonderful. And while, whoops, while Marcelina is doing that, I wanted to mention I'm dropping a copy of this year's accolades with all of this winning work inside into the chat. There's a PDF there. Um, and there's also a link in the agenda, uh, the, the list of presenters and bios that I shared as well. So, okay. Well, without further ado, Marcelina, would you like to please do that? Um, okay, is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. So this is Fruit of the Poisonous Tree. Just as the apple got caught in Eve's throat, the words linger in the back of mine. I never told anyone. It's a cruel joke being surrounded by choke me girls who have never known the, the fear of a strangled breath, the bruised throat, the muffled screams. I never told anyone. My Garden of Eden, raped, soaked with the blood of every mistake that I ever made. How was I supposed to know what a serpent looked like when I came up from a family of snake charmers? I never told anyone. A paradox wanting to be consumed by love but not ever wanting to be touched again. Idealistic dreamer caught between fear and being okay with not knowing any better. I never told anyone. Mary Magdalene, call me painted whore, devout follower, prostitute in the eyes of men and all the women who never knew. I never told anyone. Plaster saint preaching fem feminism unbiased as if I have never known the pain, like my mother never knew the pain and hers before her. I never told anyone. Holy Mary, mother of God, why did you abandon me? Protector of women, hypocrite, he did not come upon me like the Holy Spirit. I never told anyone. Glory be to the God that fucking cares. Glory be to the sacred and bloody words spoken out of the confessionals. 
Glory be to the women who made your goddamn wine and your sisters who needed that fucking bread. I never told anyone. Call us Jezebel, call us Tamar, call us Lot's virgin daughters, call us naive Dinah, call us too strong Lilith, call us the, the women blamed for the world's sins, call us the women who anoint you in secret, call us sister, daughter, friend, call us anything but victims. We told you, you just never listened. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My camera glitched there. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Marcelina, you're welcome to read your piece if you'd like. There's time. Um, um, yeah, um, let me see. Does anyone want to hear anything specific? I love how you take requests. That is my kind of. Marcy, <laughs> how about witches? Mm, great. Okay. Um, let me just pull this up. Sorry, just a second. It's not the right one, I'm so sorry. I'll just read it off my phone. Just because I can't right now. <laughs> just showed up, Marcy. I think we can see it. Okay. Um, And of course, it's not like I ever have anything labeled. <laughs> okay, here it is. <clears throat> the women in church say that we are witches. They hold in point with quiet whispers, warn their granddaughters to not be like us. We'll give them the evil eye, make them fat, steal their husbands. Women who ask too many, who ask questions too loudly are witches. Women who don't take communion are witches. They think it is strange that we, that our crosses don't show, that we don't go to confession, that we don't bow our heads in church. Witches are women who don't get invited to potlucks. Witches are women who didn't stay to raise a family. Women who didn't stay are witches. They say we are witches because our grandmother was one that I must be because I have her name. We are witches because we don't lower our voices. Witches are women who wear too much black, have wild hair, wear too much makeup or not enough. Witches are women they don't know. Gorgeous. You can feel that power just like. <laughs> Thank you. Oof. Marcelina, congratulations on your gorgeous Thank work. You. Thank you so much for being here and your reading. All right. What incredible human is next? Who? I mean, Marissa. Marissa, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. Welcome and congratulations. Would you please introduce yourself and uh, Marissa, one, in two areas. Sorry, I just asked you a question and then cut you off because I realized I had not yet mentioned your pieces. So let me do that first. Marissa has one in uh, two categories, or well, one category in two spots. Um, the first is a piece called Ticking of a Secondhand Clock, and that's the fiction runner-up. And your second piece, A Love Letter to Oceans, Sands, and Warm Blue Eyes, was Fiction Honorable Mention. Congrats again. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be reading my uh, runner-up piece, Taking of a Secondhand Clock. 
Fingers drumming. <clears throat> Sorry. Fingers drumming. Second hand of the clock ticking. Breath sighing. Glancing again and again at the appointment reminder on your phone. Checking again and again the email confirming the date and time. Waiting. Like a snowstorm, gray in the distance, close enough to smell, but not enough to feel. Staring out the kitchen window into the winter sky, cocoa in hand. Waiting to see if the storm will cut off your cable connection and silence the atrociously acted hallmark movie on the screen. Like the single silent moment that exists between the end of an orchestra's warm-up and the beginning of their performance, conductor's arms rising dramatically in the still air, thin white stick held between white gloved fingers. Like looking out your window and seeing a torrential monsoon beating the asphalt at 6 a.m. Waiting by your phone for your school to admit defeat and allow you to stay home. Like the wrinkled texture of a letter, university logo inscribed on the side. Fate held in your hands but not to be opened. Both parents can peer over your shoulder on the couch in your living room. Like cold kitchen tile pressed into the naked bottoms of your feet. Eyes peering blankly through your mind's hazy daydreams, only coming into focus at the sound of the tea kettle boiling. Waiting. It seems like the space of our lives is spent waiting. Waiting for graduation, waiting for a job, waiting for love, waiting for confidence. What do you think humans would do if we didn't have to wait? If all of a sudden we discovered that we could live as ourselves now, rather than seeking permission to become ourselves after we've lost 10 pounds or gotten a promotion or fixed our teeth or cured our depression. You wait even now for the next 20 minutes to be up or more largely for the pandemic to end. You wait for validation, good grades or a publication to accept any praise. You wait for change, expecting one day to wake up and find yourself capable of being a person that you haven't yet become. Waiting gives you purpose, eases the fear pressing at the seams of your throat. You're not stalling, you're not falling behind, you're not failing, you're waiting. You can be unhappy now because you're waiting for the day when you won't be. Trapped by caution and a fear of the unknown, you stare at the red tile on your bedroom floor, or press play on another video, or stay up for yet another sleepless night. Simply put, you sit back and wait for your life to begin. The end. Beautiful. Ah, this is just gorgeous. You could really feel like the gravity of waiting through your prose. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Great job and great work. All right. Let's see who is next. Melissa, Melissa, are you here? Hi. Hey, great to see you. Sorry we didn't connect earlier. We gave it an effort. <laughs> sure did. Um, how can I support you? Thank you. Um, if you would be willing to pull up uh, the uh, image, video, whatever, after um, my intro or bio, um, and just kind of go from there. Sure. Okay. Let me find that. Do you want the original that sort of the boomerang feel? Uh, whatever, uh, I guess, comes to mind. <laughs> All right. Got you. Um, sounds good. I will do that. And let me stop sharing. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go on, please. And welcome to, <laughs> welcome to Melissa Cunningham, who is the uh, 
winner of the image category and is uh, and the image that is on the cover of your, the accolades booklet that you're all able to check out um, in the chat is, uh, is carries that beautiful image. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Melissa Cunningham. Hi. Um, I am a multimedia artist who defines art as the journey of intention. My modes of expression include application of healing modalities, music, mixed media visual arts, poetry, prose writing, and general approach to life. I am inspired by psychological, philosophical, and spiritual inquiry. And uh, the scene that Emily is going to pull up um, is of a ceremony that took place on December 12th, 2021, outside the Lady Guadalupe Church in Santa Fe, uh, which later that day became an experiment um, in applying digital filters to a moving image. Um, and I added an original song titled She. Um, and there it is. Thank you. Stunning. And evocative and beautiful. Really, truly, just even, just to even to look at the colors, you know, the composition. It's really Thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Ooh. Great. And again, that PDF should be in the chat if you'd like to also check it out on your own. Yeah. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> so next, I'm very excited to welcome, let me get to the Zoom. All right, we have, we have Ro Calhoun, who writes stories, she writes short stories and poetry, and she is a visual artist. She teaches a course called Creative Expression at Santa Fe Community College. And Ro won in two areas. Uh, her poem, Forgive Me, won a poetry honorable mention. And uh, the creative nonfiction winner was entitled, Do You Know How to Fight? And Ro, are you here? I am. Yay! Welcome. Thank you. So I'll just speak right directly to everybody. So I'm a girly girl, and you wouldn't think that I know how to fight as a self-proclaimed kumbaya, make love, not work kind of gal. However, due to situations experienced early in life, I learned how to fight. As a child, my father's work required us to move regularly. So the first four of us, my siblings and I, we were all born in different states. I went to three different elementary schools. Therefore, I was always an outsider, starting from scratch in different states, neighborhoods, and schools. When you do that, you can be challenged to defend and prove yourself. And sometimes you have to do it physically. My father was a fighter. As an immigrant who came to the United States from Greece, speaking no English, he fought his way through the Chicago public school system. And he taught me and my brothers, don't start fights, but if someone starts it, you have to finish it. As youngsters, we moved into the first home that my parents owned. And shortly after, my brother Stephen and I had to fight. We were in our yard on a misty gray day when some neighborhood kids came storming over and attacked us in our own backyard. We both grabbed fallen willow branches from the ground and fought them off like we were warriors yielding swords in combat. Later that day, one of the mothers of these boys had the nerve to come over, knocking at our door to complain that her son had, had welts on him from us. Well, my mother let her have it with a verbal lashing. Teach your boy some manners. Tell your kid not to come over and trespass on our private property with the neighborhood welcoming committee of bullies and then start crying when they get hurt. My favorite childhood fight story, however, was from my second elementary school when I was in the fifth grade during singing class. I really enjoy singing. 
but sadly, I cannot carry a tune. Plainly stated, I'm a bad singer. My whole family lacks musical ability. Anyhow, I was joyfully singing away one afternoon in music class, and yes, out of tune, when Karen Tuttle, a blonde-haired classmate, leaned in toward me, whispering in my ear, telling me to stop singing. I tossed her a dirty look and con continued to belt it out. She leaned over once again and said tersely, if you don't shut up, I'm going to beat you up. I crunched my face on her and I shrugged her off. I would not be intimidated. And music class continued without incident. After class, we were crossing over the concrete playground from the music building back to the main academic building. Suddenly, I felt a great weight on my back and I knew immediately that it was Karen and that it was going to be something that I could not shrug off this time but I did not miss a beat because this was not my first rodeo. We were quickly on the ground, tumbling and punching and scratching and pulling hair and scraping our knees and elbows on the concrete pavement. When the teacher realized what was going on, she ran over, broke up our little bloody battle. We were pulled apart, our mothers were called, and we were separately called into the principal's office to explain what was going on. Afterwards, I went back to class. Karen did not. Students crowded around me with excited curiosity. Are, are you hurt? Who won the fight? Honestly, I don't know who won. It was so fast and furious. I just knew we were both hurting pups. However, I returned to school the next day and Karen did not show up for three more days. So I guess I won. As you might guess, we never had anything to say to each other after that. Then once again, my family moved and I went to grammar school number three. <coughs> Fast forward, years later into the future for a school reunion. I was so excited to go see my former classmates, especially my campfire girlfriends. So I traveled from New Mexico back to my Chicago suburb for the school reunion. I have a name tag on and I'm on a stool at the restaurant bar and people are mingling and some come up to me. One woman tells me how great I look and inquires how I'm doing. I thank her and say I'm doing quite well and I live in New Mexico and I'm so excited to be here for this reunion. And when she leaves, I think to myself, I have no idea who that woman was. A few minutes later, she returns and says, Rosalie, I am so glad that you are here. I have felt guilty for years for how mean I was to you and I want to apologize for my behavior and I hope that you will forgive me. I look at her quizzically saying, well, all is forgiven because I have no idea what you're talking about. So it must have not been that big of a deal. She refreshes my memory. I'm the girl who jumped you after singing class. My jaw drops slightly and I slowly nod. Ah, yes, now I do remember who you are. Please forgive me, Karen repeats. I'm a therapist now. What an awful thing for a future therapist to do. <laughs> I start laughing. Karen, truly, I was never traumatized over the incident. Actually, it's one of my favorite stories that I've told people over the years. When someone wants me to get up and sing karaoke or something like that, I tell them, no, really, really, I'm a terrible singer. I am so bad that I got into a fight with a girl over my singing. And I tell them about our fight. And I'm not kidding, Karen, you gave me a great story. All is well, and you are certainly forgiven. So we laugh about that and go on to have a really lovely evening. So Karen, the mean girl, changed her ways and grew up to be a conscious human. We are now Facebook friends, and she stands up for social justice on her posts. I remain a peace and love kumbaya girl, and even my fighting story has a happy ending. Namaste. That was a wild, fun ride. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Really felt like you were there. 
and your punchy, awesome self. Yay. Thank you so much. That was delightful. Congratulations. All right. Our next reader, I thought maybe I'd invite Terry. Terry, Terry Wilson is one of our just longtime beloved creative writing instructors at SFCC. And um, I can't even imagine how many lives she's transformed or, or touched. Um, and Terry, I thought maybe I'd invite you since many of your students are here this evening, um, not surprised. Um, I thought maybe I'd invite you to introduce our next, our next reader. Okay, and that is uh, Christine, right? Yes, it is. Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> I just wrote something down. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Christine has been in my class for eight months now, and I'm so proud of her. At first she was shy, but now she's writing stories full, so full of life and energy and speeding cars that I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's uh, Her fire is hard to contain. Let me say that. <laughs> Yay, Christine. Thank you so much, Terry. That's really sweet. That means a lot. You've really helped me a lot. I've, I've loved your class. Thank you so much. Christine, I, I'd like to just quickly insert that your piece opening it up was the runner up in fiction. And please welcome, go for it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen. Audrey often felt like a part of the wallpaper at work or at family gatherings. A receptionist for eight years at a foreign car dealership in Cincinnati, Ohio, AKA the Paris of America, Audrey often found herself daydreaming of places like the actual Paris. Moonlight, romance, cheese and baguettes with buttery smooth red wine that warmed her soul. Gazing into the eyes of a sizzling stranger who spoke a language she mostly couldn't understand a perfect fantasy because of her intense fear of speaking to handsome men. The words would just not come out, and when they did, they would always come out tragically awkward. In her place of work, there were countless gorgeous men who walked by her desk every day, whom she'd admired from afar, but could never quite look them in the eye or talk to them when they would say something witty near her desk. But afterwards, she would replay the moment over and over again with her much cooler inner self-directing, thinking up the perfect flirty comeback with coordinating high five moment and wink plus finger snap gun move. Hmm, maybe I should rethink the finger snap gun move, she pondered. Just then, Brad with the gorgeous hair from sales passes by, interrupting her wandering mind, startling her a little with his confident deep voice. Hey, uh, Susan, need these facts to the services department by the end of business, thanks. Audrey takes the papers, catching the quickly passing scent of sandalwood and maple syrup as her boss, Larry, takes Brad's place in front of her desk. Eating a strawberry glazed donut with a giant crumb hanging from his bottom lip, Larry says, Aubrey, need this notarized ASAP, and would you be a doll and grab us all some Italian coffees from that little place next door with just a splash of soy milk and a dusting of brown sugar? And please, 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 not any whole milk like last time. All I can say is yikes. Okay, great. He didn't even look me in the eyes, she realized. And Aubrey? Ugh, at least that's way closer than Susan. She quietly sighs. Looking up, she catches a glimpse of a poster that hangs across from her desk near the window of which she often gazes. The poster is of a beautiful woman driving a 2018 Ferrari Portofino in yellow jacket gold. Audrey pauses to admire it, resting her chin in her hand. The woman is in the driver's seat with city lights reflecting in the paint of the powerful pony. The woman is sure of herself, old world beautiful and clearly European. 
advertisements like that just don't appear, don't usually appear in American culture. A woman driving alone or at all, Aubrey thought, wouldn't want to get that idea out into the minds of women that they can actually be independent and have their own money. Gasp, Audrey said to herself. Audrey recognizes a few French words on the poster and decides to refer to this woman in her mind as the Parisian woman. The Parisian woman is fierce in her self-assuredness in this captivating emancipated moment with brilliant azure scarf sailing behind her and Audrey fantasizes about what that must feel like. Just then she's struck with a wild idea. No, she says moving her hand to her mouth and then giggles as if she's having a tete-a-tete with herself. Forgetting where she was, she looks up quickly to make sure no one had heard her, which of course they hadn't. She ponders her idea for the rest of the day, realizing what a perfect opportunity she has at her fingertips. From her tiny printed floral button all the way up shirts that her mother insisted she wear, to her small office footprint, to the first one in, last one out dedication in which she worked, no one would ever suspect. That night, about an hour after the last machismo salesman left the building with token hot new girl attached to his arm, who noticed the dry fern plant in the lobby, but not her, she knew it was time. With palms drenched and a feeling like she was going to throw up, but her spirit overflowing with more energy and life than she can remember, she decides to go for it. She was tired of being, sorry, she was tired of being a by the book Betty. She wanted to start coloring outside the lines, even if it was just one single red line outside a bold black border. She looks around at the darkened abandoned office, for the first time noticing the still beauty in it all. With the loud hums of the vacant office equipment and mini fridges that, like her, were so loyally waiting to be useful. Taking her janitor-sized keys out, clinking them together as her hand shook, she opens the door to her boss's office and immediately spots the keys to the vintage cars, hanging on the wall, just waiting to be taken. She hesitates for a moment, but then she remembers she knows where all of the cameras are in the lot because of how many times she had to get up on the ladder to clean the cobwebs off for her lazy boss, Larry, and she knew she could maneuver around them. Her mother and father were both in the racing scene back in the day before injuries, drug addiction, and a tragic fatality stopped them in their tracks. <clears throat> Audrey had the fire of engine fuel burning through her veins and had learned to drive a race car before she could tie her shoes. But after the tragedy of her father's death that ripped her apart at such a young age and her mother's fearlessness that turned into fierce control over anything remotely dangerous as far as her daughter was concerned, Audrey locked her passion up inside her, refusing to let herself open up again until tonight. She scans the keys with dilated pupils, waiting for the right one that matches her soul to connect with a ping. There it is, she said calmly. A fire red 2002 Cherry Ferrari 360 Spider. She grabs the keys and steps out into the vacant parking garage. The sound of her size six footsteps echo in the vast garage and the pound pound of her chest make her feel more alive than ever before. The gleam of the liquid fire paint transfixes her as she walks closer, sealing her fate. She inserts the key, opens the door and slowly lowers herself into the squeaky clean black leather driver's seat. She swings both legs over and places her hands delicately and assertively onto the steering wheel as the classic yellow and black stallion gleams back at her. She fastens her seatbelt and prepares herself with a slow yet confident, let's do this, exhale. She turns the key, igniting the engine. The glorious growl fills her ears and her entire body. She takes off, moving like the thing is on rails, taking tight curves to avoid the cameras and because it's fun. She is one with the machine. Remembering days at the track with her dad, she zooms past each corner, straight away, corner. She feels the boom, boom of the exit grates below her tires, squealing onto the main road and finally releases the breath she unknowingly held until that point. She's free, a feeling she hasn't felt since she was a child. She can finally breathe and suddenly sees herself as the Parisian woman of her dreams. Her whole life opens up. The rush of escaping floods through her along with a feeling that no one and nothing can stop her. The cool night air feeds her soul and cools her hot skin. 
She slows to a stop at the light, plugs in her iPod, and flips to the soundtrack of her favorite movie, Drive. The, sound, the song Night Call starts at the same time as the light glows neon green, and she takes off into the night. With her newborn passion exploding through her veins with no end in sight, she heads toward the on-ramp of the Cincinnati Highway, smiling ear to ear with one goal in mind, opening it up. All right, Christine. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was amazing. <laughs> so, um, congratulations, Christine. And um, actually, I wanted to invite Kelly. Kelly Marquez, are you here? Ma'am. Hello. Um, hi. hi. Um, so I wanted to invite Kelly to um, take over for just a second here. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thank um, you. Good evening, everybody. So my name is Kelly Monkis. I am the Director of Annual Giving, and I am with Santa Fe Community College Foundation. So the foundation is the arm of the college that does fundraising. We do fundraising for scholarships and special programs at the college. So one of the great things that I get to do is not only do I get to raise funds for events like this and the awards that um, are part of this, but I get to just you know participate. So that's fantastic. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the donor and how this came to be. So we have um, Katie Besser, who is a great advocate for Santa Fe Community College, and she was a poet and a creative writer. And one of the things that her husband wanted to do to honor her upon her passing is to create an opportunity for SFCC students to have a venue to not only speak and do their creativeness in a open forum, but also to give them a nice little incentive with some kind of an award. So there will be awards, of course, for all the winners and the runners up. And this was in honor of Miss Katie Besser. Now, in conjunction with all of that, the foundation also awards scholarships. And these are to the tune of $1,000 for full-time students. And the winner of the Richard Bradford Memorial Creative Writing Scholarship. So this scholarship is named after the author of the 1968 classic Red Sky at Morning, um, Richard Bradford, obviously. There were three donors that participated in creating this endowment, and that is um, Michael McGarity, who is also in turn an author. We have arts advocate Charmé Allray, all right, excuse me, who we lost a couple of years ago. So in her honor, thank you very much. And also with our former city councilwoman, um, Rebecca Wurzberger. So these are the three donors who came together and decided that they really wanted to support a creative student in their academic endeavors. So I have the pleasure of um, announcing that the winner for this year's $1,000 scholarship for the Richard Bradford Creative Writing Endowed scholarship is Miss Christine Schwarkin. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I'm so honored. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. So shocked. So this is something that will um, take effect in August for this next academic year. So 22-23 and congratulations. Wow. Thank you so very much. I'm so excited to continue writing. Thank you. You've got a knack, I think. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Congratulations again, Christine, and thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to more of your work. Thank you so much. Yay, Christine. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep this party going. And we will move on to our next reader, who is Neil. No, that would be me. Fantastic. Would you like for me to read your bio for you? Sure. All right. That would be nice. Thank you. I would be delighted to do that. Thank you. All right. 
Neil Norby is a longtime reader and first time creative writing classer. He spends most of his days at his desk, hopping from topic to topic and ending up with scads of open, open tabs. <laughs> it's like open labs, teacher brain, open tabs, much to the concern of his computer in hopes of contributing to his story ideas. Usually it works out for him. And Neil won in two different spots here. We've got The Flight of the Cabbages, a poetry runner-up, as well as A Different Sky, which was a fiction honorable mention. Thank you so much for being here, Neil. Congratulations. Thank you for having me. Great. I will be reading Flight of the Cabbages. The winged cabbage rock alights atop a downy wing. So cleverly, it sheds the dust of countless ages. The ages that may never come again. For can it not be said that time is merely a straight line moving ever onwards? Fear not this dismal thought. For it can to be said that all of time's a wheel a turning once again to bring forth the ages past long ago. The wing of yet another cabbage rock it is, for this, their yearly perching time, has brought them to a single grassy knoll amidst the sea. Not swans the flying creatures here, no fairy tale in which they're found to fear. One cabbage lands, then turns to rock, the better not to move, as all the other cabbages begin the cabbage fractal tree. A spiraling, soaring, twisting thing, a whirlwind formed of rock and wing. Yet whirlwind, it can't truly be this wondrous thing above the sea. For motionless they sit, so free, a calm and cheerful destiny. A whirlwind would be swift and dizzy and leave them all in quite a tizzy. Unlike the rock spin sculpture here that will not move for many a year. Spiraling ever deeper into the earth, discarded feathers make their birth so far from their place of birth atop the heavenly peaks of mirth. Such joyous laughter to be heard when start to feather did each bird. All this without a spoken word, for such was not their want. A tense and thrilling nightly haunt, with all who heard from bed bestirred. Cleverly, carefully, children collect the stony pinions which descend from the sky, rinsing them off and wondering why. Why, oh why, do all of these feathers fall from the sky? Were the givers like onions, which shed every tear, and must draw them forth from each person they knew? If so, who must sadly lose flight from their wing? Truly, if told with sorrow, they'd sing. Onion or not, the path forward was clear. Tradition had merit, twas truly the cheer. Now they would conjure with strength of their arms, use their effort to conflict a bed in their barns. With pulleys and levers, contraptions galore, they'd work and they'd work till their bodies went sore. Never till now had the ritual worked, but also there'd not been such feathery murk. Surely abundance would make up for skill and summon forth once more prime village maker will. Before he'd vanished in time left untold, this had been the signal he was needed against cold. Smaller and smaller their village had shrunk during centuries that passed without clanking or clunk. Furnaces, boilers, engines, and more all had gone silent post his walk out the door. Legends still had it, they'd angered him sore. 
but maybe he'd mellowed since ages of yore. Upwards and downwards, the feathers they went. This was the cycle the heavens had sent. Water replaced by the stone and the earth. Sorrow and grief caused by heavenly mirth. Many a human had been crushed by a fall of a titanic feather so vast, miles tall. Even though scarce more than air was their weight, momentum and magnitude sealed the death-like fates. Tireless workers to uplift their doom. The trapped ones were each in their own separate room. Those fortunate few who could pull the feet off were granted high treasures and flagons to quaff, telling their stories and sharing their tips, cross-betting rampant toward against tricks. Any who listened to cl so closely to all would be well set, if ever in threat of the fall. I'm trying to unmute. Amazing. So great. So much word fun in there. Ah, makes me want to read your poem and then go grab some Lewis Carroll and curl up and thank you. Thank you. be in it. So wonderful. Ah, thank you, Neil. Woo. All right. Let's see what fun we have coming now. Cindy, Cindy, I know you're here. May I read your bio on your behalf? Yes, yes please go ahead, yes. Thank you. Cindy Kotner is a writer, artist, and semi-retired teacher. In her work, she combines image and word, sometimes composing with words first, then illustrating the meaning with abstract or conceptual art or vice versa. Art and writing have brought clarity and purpose to her life. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome Cindy and congratulations. Well, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I thank everybody for attending. Um, <clears throat> so you want me to try to share my screen, right? If you're down, that would be fantastic. Okay, so I, I thought I'd read the poem first and then I, I would share the two images. Will that work? That sounds great. Okay, Thank so let, let me find it. Um, Uh, okay, can y'all see that? All right. Looks great. Okay, a little uh, intro. Um, this passing, this poem is written about a moment when my father uh, passed away. When this happened, I had these feelings about his passing, about it being so mundane and not at all like in the movies. Um, you know, where a loved one opens an eye and smiles and signals goodbye. <laughs> so 13 years later, uh, I was able to write about it. And so this is it. <clears throat> Passing. A glare glowing through closed blinds, a murder of crows perched around my father's hospital bed. Son, son's wife, grandson, granddaughter, and firstborn daughter, me, watching him, stoic, as always. Was he breathing? I moved closer, stretching my ear to his stubble, imagining a gasp, an eye opening, him laughing incredulously. What the hell are y'all doing? The nurse enters. We step back. Perhaps she can hear a breath stethoscope to chest, moving like a clock, 12 to three to six to nine. Silence, no gasp, no last lid opening to say goodbye, just a cold passing. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. So I'll share these images um, and then talk a little bit about them. Um, so can you see the image of the goddess? Okay. So, um, so Oops, this yes, one, um, so like you said, I integrate image and text, usually a poem, and sometimes I begin with the image and sometimes the poem. And I like to think of it as diving deeper into my own spirituality and clarity. Um, I began as a calligrapher and bookmaker, and currently uh, I'm trying to write a novella uh, with my past, uh, my past art as an introduction to, into each of these chapters. So some of these pieces of art will be in that, hopefully, novella. So this one is called Goddess. And it's a piece about all the names given to the female in literature. All her labels, crone, maiden, psyche, Sophia, Pachamama, Maya, Mother Earth. Um, it is, it's, it's a semi ink brush stroke with green, gray, and yellow ochre watercolor uh, use overlaid and then hand lettered uh, the, the words in the center. So that's the goddess piece. That... Now, um, let's see, can y'all see this piece right here of the body parts? Or it is a zoomed in part of the top of the goddess image okay. okay let me do this let me take that down let me stop sharing then i'll share again how's that okay so um this one um has a poem that goes with it this is called uh, the art. It's called Beneath the Breast, and it's a combination of plaster cast female breast, stomach, and hips, with words collaged uh, onto the casting and hung by a thin filament. The original, this original, was part of a past exhibit entitled Beneath the Breast, which featured over fifty women's breasts, ages two through seventy-four, uh, who allowed me to pass, uh, plaster class their breast and they wrote their breast stories uh, collage to the inside of each casting. So after that exhibit, I took this piece of art as the, as the, the, was the focal point um, and digitally transposed a poem I had written about Marilyn Monroe behind the image. So um, it's a digital kind of enhancement. So I'll read the poem just quickly. Marilyn, focus Marilyn Monroe. I know why she did it. Suicide between the thighs, white and open, lenses focused on the prize, ether, etherizing laughter of red hot poppies on the way to Oz, timid fingers pushing down ballooning, ballooning folds of fabric, nervous smiles seducing like a million roses blooming, burning black, charred remains beneath the ashes of her sex. A detour, really. Sex getting in the way of Norma Jean beneath the flesh. Watermelon lips parted. Kissing camera clicks. Easier than to strip inside. What's inside, she thought. Nothing. And so it was easier to die. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. Thank you so much. And yeah, that, I just went so many different places. And, <laughs> and I, I love it. Thank you so much. Thank really you. That. Congratulations again, Cynthia. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see who we have up next. Is Lucinda here this evening? All right, well, let me mention then that Lucinda Slattery 
one for her piece, Stuffed Animal Factory. And uh, Lucinda placed uh, fiction honorable mention. So congratulations. And I know that Emmanuel was not able to make it, but Emmanuel John won uh, for her piece, Adrian, which was the creative nonfiction runner up and for watching the void, which was an in image honorable mention. And then we have Eliza, you're here, yeah? Uh, yeah. Would you like to read this evening? Uh, yes. Fantastic. Welcome. Would you like to please introduce yourself? Um, yeah, I'm just, I wrote this kind of intro and also uh, it kind of gives context to my piece. Um, hi, my name is Elizabeth Gardunio. My sister passed away on December 29th, 2021. And while I was dealing with the complexity of grief, over her passing. I was also dealing with debilitating anxiety related, related to interpersonal conflicts I had with two people close to me, as well as trying to maintain a semblance of fine for my six-year-old daughter. What follows is free flow poetry written during a very confusing and chaotic period in my life. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, we sure can. Okay, I'll get started. Power sours as freedom to flower is lost every hour. Am I a coward? How is powerless subjugation what I escape in? Don't tempt me, attempting to be free, but I can't flee me. Insecurity and self-loathing imposing their will on my ill brain. Insane is too inane to be rendered helpless. Help desk, please, hello, I need to stop freezing. Inside, I'm a mild version of a wreck that I was blessed to be free from, but here I am again. No plan, no money, no way, no clue. The truth always sequestered in shame as I blame and blame. God damn, underlying issues excuse me. Not enough time to run for fun, for sun and under skies. Rise if it's easy, ride when it's breezy. Unfaithful, unlawful, unstable, and only able to break or make a mistake. Pity parties under icebergs, the worst challenge. What am I if not damaged? When will the tides turn? I'm burning down to ash, the vast majority imploring me to stop. Rock myself to sleep like a child and tell myself it's okay when it's not. It's okay, but I'm distraught. It's okay, but there's a knot in my throat and one in my stomach. So throw away what I've earned, what I've learned about beauty. Why? There she is again. I like to pretend I don't see her in the mirror. I fear her. In time, it's relevant. The elephant in the room is grooming me, and there it is again. The weight of the weight, and I hesitate to love. Above a desire, I leave behind a dire need. Seeds of doubt grew into trees which feed on negativity. How to reassure myself? Selfless disguise, that's wise. He'll never surmise my cover, discover what's frightening. My routine slips away with decaying dreams of better circumstances. How do I make myself better? I'm fettered to the festering cleavage in the bosom of matriarchy. Is it ever going to be any better? Important distortion, extortion, contortion of limbs in simulation, imitation, imagination running wild, a child no longer imbued, clued into glue, the disbursement, a cursed scent, in hell, regaling details across the plane of existence. This instance no further away, a play. Anxiety, it tries to be a lifeless mass. Screwed over, screwed under. Despair, no fair. Multitasking, asking too much. Hush, scale the flea. Fit better, pester the one. Inherently, apparently a numb soul who stole. Disturbed, perturbed. Masturbate, allocate the need to feel, but it's inconsequential. I feed the pig and it wants more. It wants all I am in family and name and guilt and shame. It wants me on my knees to bleed again. I need a friend. How far can I bend backward to accommodate the slate which was never clean? It's obscene. I don't want your score. I want more than to feel dragged down. I'm drowning. I want to feel okay again. How much of myself and my peace of mind am I willing to sacrifice? Easy does it. 
I'm not above anything. I called once and spoke with a stroke. It strobed in unison, the bison of the meadow used for marrow. Despicable creatures, the lures. God is out of the way, but I'm broken. A token of memories still used to wipe the floor with my face. Learn my place. This isn't about grace. This is disgraceful. I'm hateful. I'm unable. It's wrong and I'm right about my feelings. I don't know what that means. It's too clean. Life isn't an epiphany. It's if in me. A serpent slithers silently. It rides in me. It calls to be. To be or not is a question beyond comprehension. I say unguarded treasures and measure the earth against its own worth in my weight. A barricade. A battle cage in which the battle is faltering. It ought to be. It's exalted spring. God gave birth to a mother, another, and called it man. Drastically, the past of me comes running back, running water. Tap the faucet and offset the burns to the being. Away from sabotage, a lonely lodge in the edge of, on the edge of conscience, co conscious of worldly troubles, tributes in a manner of speaking. Annoyances are many, and to carry the weight is to accept the bait. Wants a want us to be miserable. It's a scheme like Ponzi, and I'm aware that it's fake. Blake or Drake away from the blinking eye. It doesn't matter. The clatter I hear is exactly the one I feared. It's hell. If a bell could toll every hour, this is the past. I want the present. I want to be present. I want to be whole. I want control. If it's there, it's true. I falter again around another bend of time, but the hall of rhymes calls me forth. I exhibit the issue, misused, misabused, misconstrued, a misconception there's depth in, a miscalculation, misshapen, mistaken after the hour, the power gone, a powder. Mist is heavy, but not, I can't focus. I'm shattered, scattered to the wind. Begin the cleanup, it's inevitable, insensical. Fine, just go with it, it if you must just roll with it. Invaluable, how long will we be salvageable? Where am I now as the cow comes down to bow against the autumn trees? Autumn leaves are a thing of the past. I know it's endless and I feel defenseless. How could the brink be a new place and somehow defined by a new pace? But it's the old recollections I'm afraid of, but it's not. I'm dying inside, trying to hide behind love and understanding, yet I feel so demanding as guilt and guilty as hell for it. I know the truth. Our youth defiled a wild card in the midst of heaven, and hell-bent creatures with ignorant features gnaw at my toes as it goes on and on, but it's too dark to see. That's how he likes it to be. Am I in the cycle? And can I dare to hope it will actually end? Or are we playing pretend when we defend how far we've come? Is it all gone? The song is still there. Prepare it for resurrection, the ejection of the populace. I know it's us. Intimidate me in ways you have no control of. It's above your K grade. Fading into nonsense, my only recompense is knowing I stopped before going and tried slowing my heart. Now the art of science and of releasing the pressure. Maybe I'll get better in time. Oh, wow. That was gorgeous. And it was um, the lyricism and the, the rhythm, the heartbeat of it was pounding. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, great job. Thanks, Eliza. Ooh, such great stuff. Okay, our next reader. I'm very, very happy to present Irene Edwards. Irene Edwards is a member of the Pawnee Nation and of Cheyenne Heritage. After her mother passed away in 2012, she retired in 2013 and did very little. In 2015, she hiked to the bottom of the Grand Canyon on new knees and discovered herself again. She began to focus on her writing and poetry and later filmmaking at SFCC. She desires to present stories of tribal history, the human and tribal spirit to, to instill pride, inform and educate and using the film technologies of today to bring those stories to the present 
and for future generations, stories that once were only told through oral history. She has a BA in psychology from the College of Santa Fe and at SFCC received a creative writing certificate, an AA in film, and will graduate in May with an AAS in documentary and nonfiction filmmaking. Heck yeah. Woo. At 71, she wants to get her master's degree in creative writing. And I trust you will, Irene. You are incredible. Thank you so much and congratulations. And Irene's poem, Aunt Bertha's Quilt, Great Grandma, won an honorable mention in the poetry category. Irene, would you like to join us, please? And thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I'm really very honored to be part of this amazing group of writers and poets. Um, if you don't mind, I wanted to kind of share a little background uh, for the poem Aunt Bertha's Quilts. So I had seen the trendy weighted blankets for sale, the ones that are supposed to help people sleep better. I began to think about them and I thought, you know, a long time ago, they were grandma's quilts and sleeping under them, you felt secure. So I understand the weighted ones, the, the need for those. My grandma used old jeans, other blankets and cotton batting uh, between the top and bottom layers of the quilt top and the solid or print bottom that she had. In the past, she would take it to the Wednesday women's quilting circle at the church and they would set up a quilting frame and spend the afternoon quilting and visiting uh, with all the ladies. In later years, the quilting circle stopped due primarily to the passing of the members, but Gran still made quilts. Only then she used yarn placed at strategic points to hold the layers together. Nowadays, larger fabric stores have quilting machines and you can take your quilt, set it up, choose the quilting design that you want, press a button and the machine does it all for you. There would be a, about two or three quilts on the beds during the winter and they were heavy. The heater would be turned off at night for safety reasons. And so the quilts kept you very warm. But in the morning, you had to make sure you had your socks on before they hit the cold linoleum floor or you would be awakened rather abruptly. The quilt I wanted to share um, the background, uh, the background here, and I, I really don't like using backgrounds because it distorts your face, like your head is missing half of it or whatever. But um, I wanted to share a picture. Um, okay, so this is the one I wanted to share. Um, when I read, but the quilt being used as my background was made by my grandma using leftover fabric pieces from my daughter's clothes, which my grandma made starting when she was a baby to when she was in grade school, and some of mine are in there too. The designs on a quilt made for me by my Aunt Bertha, my great grandma, and Pawnee Kinship um, were squares of uh, a fan design. I used to use it, but later I put it away because the fabrics were now thin and fragile and having been made. What? Huh? Oh, so you all are not really seeing the picture? Let me see. Are you? Yeah, that's a different picture for sure. Okay, so it's there now? Okay. Thank you. My daughter is uh, listening in and watching on her phone. <laughs> so my apologies for that. But I just wanted to say that those um, fabrics, uh, that quilt was made in the, in the 1950s. Um, Aunt Bertha also made quilts from my baby dolls when I was a kid. And I also have a watermelon quilt made for me by my mom. The screen I'm sharing is of grandma's quilts with photos of the three quilt makers in my family. The top photo is Aunt Bertha, 
Uh, the middle photo is my grandma, her daughter, Grandma May, and then my mom, my grandma's daughter, Geraldine. It's a precious legacy of quilts and quilt makers. I have yet to take up quilting. Maybe one day, I'm not sure. But here is Aunt Martha's quilt. Handed down through the ages, made in several stages, calico and solids, colors soft and bold, pattern fabrics delicate and old. Hand sewn with love and prayers, circles, octagons, and squares, looking at each single block at what maybe was a smock. There's Claire's first toddler dress and even grandpa's shirt in the process. So many a good thought, these cannot be bought. For a night of good sleep and sweet dreams among the hand-stitched steams, these were the heavy quilts we used, not the modern weighted blankets, she said, amused. And that's it. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Irene. And thank you so much for sharing about your family and more about your grandmother and about the process of quilting and all, all the ways it weaves into family and our histories. I loved, I loved learning about that and imagine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, How do I stop sharing? Oh, I see the little button. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for sitting through that. I felt like the thought process was also important going from weighted blankets to, to that, but thank you. And thanks again. I'm just, I mean, I was just like elated at even honorable mention. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much inspiration here this evening. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we're going to wave goodbye to some folks who are taking off because it's it's nearly finals, and um, Terry's class is technically in session. So, let her get on with that. And thank you again to those who are leaving, who have read or come to support your friends and family. Thank you so much for being here, and we will also continue on. And uh, please. Hey, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Terry. It's so great to see you. Oh, my. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yay. Oh, and I see that. Um, okay. Melissa dropped in the chat uh, the YouTube video of the with the original image that was submitted that one in the image category. So um, have a look at that. And I will share my screen to invite our next reader. Let's see here. Let's, what, what just happened? All right, here we go. So, oh, wow. there it is. Okay, can everyone see this? I'm very happy to invite Anna Carvelin to read. Um, Anna Carvelin is an incredible writer and Anna Carvelin is a public health advocate yoga instructor, writer, and aspiring fiddler. She is the author of two books, Untimely and Dwell at My Door, which gives voice to the people behind substance use disorder and homelessness. Her essays have appeared in Bending Genres and Southside Weekly. Anna was born in Santa Fe and now lives with her family in Chicago. You can find her at that spot right there. And Anna has one for her poem, Red Scare, uh, and placed as an honorable mention. And Anna, thank you so much for being here this evening and welcome. Congratulations. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm in my car. I'm escaping my toddler for a few minutes, um, but I really am enjoying everybody's reading. Um, and yeah, and well, Terry just left. I, I was actually just talking about Terry's class today. I'm trying to work toward a certificate. Um, 
and I took Terry's class, I think it was in 2008. So that was the first creative writing class I took um, at the community college. Um, and so I wrote this poem, Red Scare, uh, after seeing some images about the war in Ukraine and it really affected me and I just felt really um, emotional about it and I just didn't know what to do with that those emotions and I was actually in a writing group and we did a we did a free write um and this is what came out of that and so I just I mean of course I, I worked on it a little bit after that but it just um it was just one way to feel and think about the uh the images that were so hard to see so I will read um Red Scare <laughs> his blood on the sheets is crisp sorrow Bright ruby abstraction on white canvas. Beet root or cherry juice spilled, still new. A contrast so sharp it condenses all the excruciation. He hadn't yet tasted wine or watermelon in summer or given someone roses. Thank you for listening. And again, I appreciate everybody's reading and I'm excited to hear more. And a, Thank you. Yeah, it's a piercing poem, I feel, with the imagery and the ache. Thank you so much. All right. We have only a few more presenters. So let's see here. <clears throat> Oops. Zoom malfunction. One second. Let's try that again. All right. Here we go. So I'm very happy to invite Theodore Bo Bloyd. And um, Theodore, are you here? Perhaps not. Let me just make sure I'm not missing something in the chat. All right, well, I'd like to acknowledge Theodore Bloyd um, who did send in a bio. So uh, first year student Theodore Bloyd um, perhaps we'll not be reading anything. <laughs> we'll read absolutely anything with words on it. Um, perhaps not this evening. Uh, serial boxes included, though he definitely prefers fantasy and fan fiction. Um, he spends most of his time writing, playing the viola and completing video games and hanging out with friends online. And Theodore's piece, Seraphim, won a uh, fiction honorable mention. So. Congratulations, and definitely say hello if you happen to be here. Um, next, I'd like to invite Patrick Simpson, who nominated Aramie Chavez, uh, and who and Aramie won the uh, instructor nominated category with her essay, Then I Would Hear Her, which you can find in the accolades booklet. Pat, are you here? I'm here, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. There I am with bad lighting. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I, I'm just so overwhelmed by all the beauty and wonder and uh, uh, challenges that that all of you have have given to us this evening. It's it's amazing. It's just amazing. Um, uh, Arami has uh, written this amazing story that she doesn't want me to read. And she's an amazing person that she doesn't want me to describe. Um, so uh, I am here to uh, honor the, red, the reticent among us, those of us who just can't quite come out and be a public person. Um, and uh, um, if you do have a chance to read this story, um, she only wrote it because her teacher told her to write it. And uh, it's, it's, uh, mysterious and it is um, intriguing and it is not just a little creepy. Um, and she wrote that as a personal essay for crying out loud. So Aramie, I'm just so amazed by you. Um, I know you're not listening, but still I'm so amazed by you. And uh, as we walk around the Santa Fe Community College and we see students who appear to be just walking along doing their thing, on this hard scrabble, unforgiving path that we're all walking. 
uh, just know that they might have written an amazing story. That's all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. I wish I could give you like an award for that introduction. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and blessings and congrats to Aramie, wherever you are. Yeah, I'm gonna to try to get her to watch the recording anyway. Perfect, that, yeah. that can be done in an alone space. Yeah. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much again, Pat. And sure, yeah, thanks to everybody. I believe that we are, to Ian Reshka, and I hope I said your name right. Um, Ian, are you here? I am here. Awesome. Welcome, and thanks for being here, and congratulations on winning the academic essay category with your Awakened Intelligence version 2.0. And you. um, you're welcome. Um, I wanted to also read this little bio here that you shared. Um, Ian moved to Santa Fe from Ohio last year and is currently pursuing an associate in creative writing at SFCC. And we're really glad that you're here. Welcome and congrats. Thank you so much. Uh, this is an honor for me. I've written since I was little. I've never won anything from my writing before. So it definitely is showing me that all of my hard work is, is uh, paying off. So this means a lot to me and everyone has been really great tonight. So um, yeah, so essentially my essay is an argumentative essay. Um, it's in response to Nicholas Carr's, uh, is Google making us stupid? So I argued against his claims um, and supported my thesis with uh, things that showcase just how humanity has advanced since the advent of technology. So uh, because my my essay is a little lengthy um, and we're kind of strapped for time, I think I picked a few excerpts uh, that I think highlight and showcase what I what I tried to convey. So um, hopefully they intrigue you guys enough to want to read the whole thing. So I am going to share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? Oops, yes, it looks great. Thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, so the machines are taking over. We are living in the matrix. Why think for yourself when a computer can do that for you? I have heard these statements and aspects of this propaganda in books, film, music, and now in Nicholas Carr's essay, Is Google Making Us Stupid? Statements like these elicit a response that we are in danger of losing control. We are sentient creatures with the ability to think, act, and feel according to our own free will. Those are things that I personally would never freely relinquish control of. However, in hearing these calls of alarm, it allows one to step back and really look at how much technology has been seemingly doing the thinking for us. We have been surfing the World Wide Web for more than three decades now. The internet is our bank, video store, church, the virtual diary, photo album, shopping mart, and library. We devour information with gusto and often forget to even wipe our mouths. Information goes just as easy as it comes. Carr believes that this is a bad thing and questions whether this has had a dumbing effect on our brains. However, I suggest the contrary. We are simply operating with a different aspect of intelligence, an intelligence that not only has made our lives easier, but gives us the upper hand against the ever-growing threat of the machines. Anything new makes humans wary. That is ingrained in us since we dwelled in caves. But what is unique about computers is that they are the last form of media before artificial intelligence becomes commonplace. Some would believe this is the natural progression of things. The techies, trekkies, hackers, and whores of commerce are salivating at the potential for AI to become a reality. Artificial intelligence is a concept that has been demonized often in fiction and revered in big tech circles. 
and it is making its presence known more now than ever. Alexa, not only answers our burning questions, but she also locks our doors, dims the lights, and activates the security system. Our doorbells come equipped with cameras and two-way audio feeds. The house is now a veritable computerized fortress. Home used to be where the heart is, but now it is where the motherboard is. The computer itself is making us get excited and question whether AI is ethical or not. We must not forget that it is still the human brain that invents this technology and often is the one that must continue to fix it and improve upon it. Technology is an expression of our own innate genius and it would not be here if not for us. I am more aware of how plastic the mind is to act as a weapon against any Orwellian threat of computerized assimilation. At the end of the day, it is up to the individual if they still desire to read in an immersive way. No one, including the internet, has taken that ability away from you. It has been merely, it has merely been placed in standby mode. If computers have the power to give us a multitude of information at a moment's notice, then we too have just as much power to unplug from them and focus the way we used to. Therefore, all is not lost. It just needs to be awakened anew amongst the sea of Wi-Fi signals and binary code. The machines win only if we allow them to win. Um, that's it. <laughs> I agree. You convinced me with your arguments to the essay, that's for sure. Oops, sorry, <laughs> camera there. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thank you so much again. And it makes me kind of regret asking Alexa this morning for um, my astrology reading for the day. Maybe I should have done that myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, well, we are to our last presenter. It's hard to believe, and it feels like it's a blur the last couple of hours almost of such beautiful work um, that I am very, very happy to introduce Nehemiah Martinez. Um, and so, oh wait, Nehemiah, do you wanna introduce yourself? I see that it's written maybe like that. Um, yeah, of course. Okay. So um, my name is uh, Nehemiah Martinez. This is my second role participating in this, um, this contest. And I wanna say thank you to Emily and for the judges for giving me these um, achievements. I'm currently at SFCC getting my associate's degree in media arts. And so when I'm done, I wanna become a well-known graphic artist and work for a company or or have a business of my own and sell my my designs in and as well as create um, posters, logos, flyers, and business cards. Woohoo! I can see it so clearly, Nehemiah. Um, and so, Nehemiah, you won uh, two two different uh, image category spots: the Lady of Guadalupe image runner-up and the New Mexico sign, which was an honorable mention. Would you like to share those this evening? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Let's see. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, so um, the first one I wanna present is the Lady of Guadalupe. Um, this, this piece inspired was from my, inspired from my grandma who sadly passed away last year. And what I remember from my grandma, she would always um, talk about her whenever I went to go, when, whenever I went to her house. And I would always see like little mementos around her, around her house, like images. And because she loved her so much. And so the background I chose was a turquoise because as a template because um that was her favorite color and so I thought that would be perfect for the background and then I went on and adding the Guadalupe in the middle 
and add and make it made the colors pop a little bit more. And then as well, I added flowers around because I would remember giving my grandma um, flowers for Mother's Day and birthdays. And I made the roses bright red because I would remember whenever she would do her, her makeup, she would always had um, red lipstick. So this, this um, image is a memory to her and I dedicate this, this win for her. And then, let's see. And so with this design, this is the honorable mention. I, I the, the reason I created, created this is because if I become a well-known graphic artist, I want people to know where I came from and I want them to see it rather than me telling it. And so I changed the O and added the Zia symbol because I thought that would be, um, that would um, represent New Mexico. And then I went on and adding the green chili at, to replace the I because we're, well, we're, we're well known because of our green chili. <laughs> and, add, and I added the yellow and red because that represents the color of the New Mexico flag. Thank you so much, Nehemiah. Thank you. This is a, an honor. It's an honor to get to see you over these years. May I mention that one essay that you wrote that I love so much? Of course. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Nehemiah once wrote this amazing argumentative essay about whether or not old school or new school hip hop is the best. And it was quite good. <laughs> Um, thanks for letting me share that, Nehemiah. Um, all right. We are at the end of our program, um, and I just can't begin to thank you and tell you how beautiful it's been to be a part of this uh, awards program and to have the opportunity to read and know that I'm participating in the sharing of all of this gorgeous work. And I just can't, I just congratulations a million congrats and I hope that you feel fantastic and as talented and amazing as you each are. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for coming to our classes and getting to know us and giving us this time to share together. And I'd like to especially thank, well, let me pop over to my thank you list, the ever handy. I'd like to acknowledge that the SFCC Katie Besser Student Writing Awards, Art and Writing Awards, um, and the 2022 accolades, they were directed by me, but in partnership with Peter Tosic and Media Arts at SFCC. And we could not do this without the SFCC Foundation, Val Nye and the SFCC Library, SFCC Marketing, uh, Kate McCahill, Bethany Carson, our Calm English Reading Department and Media Arts President, Dr. Rowley. And I'd like to acknowledge my deans again, uh, Dr. Wysong and Dr. Krebs and all the incredible students who submitted your work and high praise and so much gratitude to Media Arts student intern, Najme Musavi for her design and layout of the beautiful 2022 accolades booklet of winning work. Congratulations and thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you again. Yes, thank you so much. Pleasure. All mine. And um, keep an eye out on the SFCC YouTube channel. You can find a copy of this reading there or this, these presentations there in, in not too very long. So thank you so much and have a great you. night. You too, thank you so much. Thank you. Great summer, oh my goodness. Thank you.
Thank you. Great emailing with you, Ian. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take good care of yourself. Maybe next year you can submit again. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for being here. I really appreciate it. Good night, everybody.